Welcome back to God Laughs at Dirty Jokes, book reading installment, <clears throat> excuse me, number 12, starting with chapter 24, which is called Let's Be Like Jesus. Okay, yeah, I gotta get warmed up here. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's be like Jesus. It's not hard to imagine that a man named Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. He nobly wanted to help mankind preached about love, charity, and humility, and was murdered for it, leaving aside for the moment whether he was sent on a mission from God or rose from the dead. Jesus was persecuted for telling the truths of life as he saw them. He challenged the established order, those with an entrenched financial and political interest in the status quo, the powerful patriarchs and religious leaders who spent their lives climbing the social ladder, supporting and empowering those above them in the hopes that they too would be bo buoyed, 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 buoyed by social subordinates. A sustained, pyramid, a sustained pyramid scheme in pursuit and support of entrenched power. Do you think these people were going to let some penniless philosophical hippie tear down their empire in favor of the dirty, stupid common man? Who does this man think he is to tell us how to live? Those who persecuted Jesus built their lives upon corrupted religious, social, and political institutions. They had the most to lose should the falsehoods of that order be revealed by him, especially as he'd gained a sizable following and couldn't be bought off. The paradigm might have flipped, and they'd be shamed and ostracized or worse. They perceived Jesus as the very real threat he was and conspired to engineer a downfall. Jesus probably anticipated this would happen and prepared for his fate as a martyr. Jesus told truths which the powerful perhaps knew in their hearts but could not afford to admit. Instead of considering his message, the fearful authorities decided he must be discredited, slandered, killed. If Jesus came back today, I fear the same thing would happen again. Radical Christians and Muslims would probably be the most enthusiastic for him to fry. He'd tell them to stop being closed-minded and judgmental and more critically to stop perverting religion for money and power, territory, social status, and the subjugation of women, which are contrary to empathy, generosity, compassion, and love. Mm-hmm. Okay, this, is in, this part's in parentheses. Countries with repressive, autocratic, slash religious governments are all about control and always patriarchal. Armed thugs want to dictate how people live. They want to govern the sexual behavior and reproductive choices of women, mostly, the, mostly so that they have a better chance of mating with them, or at the least are able to prevent perceived rivals from doing so. An excessive desire for, for control is the unhealthy root of much mental illness and delusional ideology. The ultimate loss of control is the inability to prevent one's death, one's own death. It lies beneath all other obsessions. But no one controls life except God. What am I doing? Coffee. Got my little... <laughs> this is from uh, a couple of CDs back. I had uh, cozies made for my one CD. Okay. Unfortunately, once any set of ideas, even great ones, becomes codified... They're always susceptible to manipulation. Over time, Jesus' teachings have been co-opted and exploited by many of the kind of people who helped get him killed. Most of those who really do God's work on earth, helping the less fortunate and treating their fellow man with respect, operate under the radar. Humility prevents them from seeking profit and or influence simply for doing right. They're averse to the falseness of fame. I'm not this pure. Fame is unimportant, but I've long hoped to become a financially independent full-time artist after decades of 9 to 5, mostly so that I can live an art-centered life all the time and maybe write another book. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is still true. And I'm, I have a plan to escape the day job. That's for another day. Not immediately, but I got a five-year plan. Anyway, no. <laughs> uh, all right, so... I think of Jesus as a messenger and feel there's crossover between his role and that of an artist. Each has a calling and is compelled to share what he knows, speaking the truth as he understands it, he or she understands it, despite potential consequences. A good artist would be a bit like Jesus, trying to help himself and others become more realized and joyful. 
Still, it's valid to question any messenger slash artist motivations. Some posture for ego, egotistical reasons to cultivate fame more than anything. Some artists aren't really artists at all. An insightful messenger artist also helps us to see that great leaders, those who we look to for inspiration and guidance, and often place on pedestals, began at the same starting point as you or I. Everyone starts from nothing as no one. We create ourselves in time by accumulating experiences and knowledge and maintaining an open mind. We're each responsible for claiming our own voice. Even if it, even if it begins with the smallest bit of, res, of self-respect, it is never too late to become who you want to be. To change, we need to own who we've been before we break ourselves down and start rebuilding. Honest, <laughs> honest idealistic loudmouths, sound familiar? Often end up as artists, be they musicians, writers, or comedians, or all of the above, or as political and social activists, or some combination. They stir things, not simply to rile, but to hopefully encourage us to reflect and ponder the world more deeply, to help us become more real, to embody a way of life that doesn't require muting one's voice like the faceless kids falling into a meat grinder in Pink Floyd's The Wall. Those most fearful of authority sometimes resist those willing to challenge mores, even when the goal is to advocate for greater equality and justice. The majority dislike being lied to by the rich and powerful on a regular basis. However, it is telling that what they also can't stand is someone who won't go along with the charade. We deeply crave authenticity in a fake world, but we don't always celebrate it when we discover it. To some, the truth is offensive because it's impolite. Big mouths often lack subtlety and come off preachy, which can alienate. It's hard to remain emotionally balanced when talking about how our, how our entire genetically modified, hormonally injected food supply has become suspect. We don't know whether the government has been bought off by a massive corporation of America or has always been run by a rich cabal. Banks scam us and make us pay for their greedy mistakes with our tax dollars. George Bush cynically infected important American regulatory agencies with cronies who ignored science. Hmm. This was written in 2014, by the way, so uh, I might have used a different example if I'd written it last year. They abdicated their role as watchdogs to protect the public. His tenure felt like a sick victory of ignorant ideology over reality. <sighs> the Iraq War. I will never, I will never not feel, it's controversial, I will never not feel that George Bush, George W. Bush is an, is an, isn't an unindicted war criminal for the Iraq War. I think that was his goal. Uh, regardless of what happened, 9/11 in Afghanistan. I know that's kind of that's that's a bit heavy, a bit out there, but what the hell? Might as well go for it now. Um, America's in a strange place. We hate our fake corporatized culture, but we're addicted to it. Thus, the success of Amazon, McDonald's, Facebook, Coke, Walmart, Apple, etc., and we resist change. We're used to being lied to every day. Advertising is based on emotional manipulation. And we're bombarded constantly by fake messages of inadequacy. Other omissions seem intended to preserve polite civilization, keep you from questioning the social order and those who benefit from it. It's not necessarily a sinister conspiracy, but sometimes it feels orchestrated. There's nothing wrong with entertainment and distractions from the daily grind, but it's like candy. If it constitutes your entire diet, entire diet you will get fat, lazy, and sick. If we don't exercise our brains sometimes and debate, difficult issues, then intellect will atrophy. Even with its faults, American culture is still moving towards more honesty. If we, can, if we compare the simple morality tales of 1950s family TV shows to what we have now, the contrast is amazing. There's much more nuanced writing, mostly on cable TV, with greater moral ambiguities explored. Perhaps there isn't much honesty in public discourse because speaking certain truths can get you fired from your job, ostracized, jailed, harassed, or killed, depending on what you say and where. Russian journalists keep turning up dead when they write about the government sliding back towards an autocracy under President for Life Putin. In 2012, the Russian all-female punk rock band Pussy Riot 
who were sentenced to prison for two years for conducting a musical protest against Putin and the Roman Catholic Church, which had been in league since he came to power. Every social movement begins with a small handful of people who won't go along with an immoral status quo. Slavery, suffrage, the American labor movement, and Vietnam protests all started with idealists who acted from a belief in a higher moral law as Jesus did and paid a price for bucking the system. Tidal social waves begin small but grow over time to a tipping point, forcing politicians to respond. Oscar Wilde lampooned the elaborate pretenses of the powerful in his sharp-tongued plays, and in turn, they used the justice system to incarcerate him for homosexuality, breaking his spirit. John Lennon an honest, irreverent, and contradictory artist was nearly chased out of the country by U.S. immigration under Richard Nixon because of his peaceful bed-ins and loudmouthed opposition to the Vietnam War. Lenin's FBI surveillance and political persecution lasted five years, during which time he became understandably paranoid and made no new records. Shortly after his return to music, he was murdered by Mark Chapman. Ah, <sighs> terrible. At a Dublin concert in June 2004, my adolescent hero, Morrissey, announced the death of former, pre uh, former President Ronald Reagan and said he would have preferred if then-President Bush had died instead. Uh, not even I have wished death upon Bush or Reagan, and it would be pointless to wish it on Dick Cheney since he's a cyborg. Morrissey's confrontational, though legal, remarks about Bush resulted in a visit from the FBI. He was also interviewed by British authorities for his anti-Thatcher song, Margaret on the Guillotine. Uh, okay, so then there's a little chapter break. I want to see how much more of this there is. Okay. All right, we're getting there. When you're young, the lack of honesty and substance in the culture can be offensive. That's where I came from. It doesn't help you figure out who you want to be. Being young is about knowing little but feeling everything. You haven't lived long enough to grasp how things work and don't work. In time, you'll become more comfortable with the fact that there are many awful things that you'll never fully understand. You'll figure out enough to thrive. It's not just the young who don't understand why they don't understand the world, but young people have less experience and are less equipped to cope. If you practice examining what you really feel about things as opposed to how you think you should feel, or how others react, then you're more aligned with your nature. The further you get from your, from your core, the less you'll be able to access and trust it. You'll be lost at sea by your own doing. Hope is the key to life and joy the goal. It sounds fluffy, but it's true. Really, it really, 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 really is. It really is. Once you don't mind whether anyone thinks your, your ideas are sentimental or challenging, you're on the path to freedom. Belief is very powerful and magic is real. If you recognize you deserve to be fulfilled, your thoughts will absolutely influence and steer your life towards that reality. Excuse me one second. <coughs> yep, I really believe that. Okay, sorry, mini coffee break. <laughs> okay. Uh, trust your gut. Peer pressure is powerful and groups often behave strangely, but if something doesn't feel right, then it's not, even if you don't know exactly why. You are not obligated how you to explain how you feel to anyone, though some will nosily pry. The tingly feeling of unease might be yourself sensing danger or ill will before your brain does, sounding an alarm you should heed. Many young people aren't imaginatively cruel enough to conceive of the cynicism that corrupts others. People who lash out at us are damaged and lacking in self-esteem. When they mock you, it's their fear or self-loathing they're projecting or jealousy of your self-respect. Many supposedly heterosexual men avoid expressiveness because they, they associate verbosity and thoughtfulness with femininity. They fear association with those whose friendship might call their fragile sexual self-image into question. No one with love in their life would try to make another person feel bad. The universe is moral. Excuse me. Assholes eventually get smacked by life or in the next world. To have some of your innocence stripped is unavoidable, but if you're able to maintain youthful idealism, that vital, hopeful spark, you will live joyfully. Deep secrets unfurl for those who live with good intentions. And I really believe that too, as far as connectivity to spirit, 100%. 
Jesus reportedly said, how you treat the least among you is how you treat me. When I was a boy, I hated when kids would gang up as they inevitably do on someone with a mental or physical disability. I observed that very few kids would, would object to the harassment of a weaker peer even when they knew it was wrong because they too feared being singled out or losing status in the tribe. There's a little difference with adults. If we're not strong enough to, to defend the weak, then we're failing the decency test. A few years ago, my brother was railroaded by a deceitful manager at his part-time job at a pet store. Perhaps she perceived him as an easy target. We thought about suing the company but let it go. The process of retaliation would have added negative weight to our lives. How could it have been worth it even if we won? You can choose to forgive screwed up people who mess with your livelihood, though some may incorrectly inter interpret your empathy as weakness. You'll notice repeated behaviors among the lost, see that their problems have nothing to do with you and realize that you're not obligated to try to fix them, figure them out, talk about them, or waste time contemplating them. You owe them nothing. Move on. Now, I would add in the years since then, if you are a very highly evolved, super, super spiritually evolved being, you will even pray for people who wrong you. Um, or at the very least, not wish them harm. So that's kind of more where I live these days. Uh, when, when I come across something I don't like with another person, I try very hard if I'm angry about it just to ch chop that connection in my mind right there. Uh, not wish them any ill will, but not carry that anger. And I think I, ha I have occasionally prayed for quote-unquote enemies. Um, I prayed for the previous president one time. It wasn't easy. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to, but it, it did feel good to do it. So, uh, for whatever that's worth. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. When you're young, it's hard to understand all of your own incl inclinations and actions as a spiritual being in a new rambunctious animal's body. Your desires are natural, even the weird ones. Don't feel guilty about what you perceive as inappropriate feelings, but please be cautious about which you act upon, what you share about yourself, and with whom. Look who's talking. Uh, it can take a long time to see patterns in our lives. Some of us are self-destructive for years or decades. So, sadly, some never learn in this last time. You may have to pull, fully pass through a difficult stage and look back from a distance to understand why you felt and behaved as you did. I've done some astoundingly stupid things I can only partially explain. Forgive yourself for being dumb when no real harm is done. Apologize if necessary. Choose to learn from your mistakes. It's easier to stay positive when you pursue what makes you feel alive. And I feel this so strongly as a musician and, and you know, person who likes to write. A lot of people stuff themselves into emotionally stunted boxes because they're afraid or have internalized defeat. If you, will, if you allow yourself to become yourself, you might have a longer road. Others often want you to be what serves them best, threatens them least, or makes them comfortable. They almost can't help themselves. So this is a little repetitive now. But don't give up your essence and self-respect for nothing. We can become uniquely beautiful creatures who no longer seek or desire praise and give up our animosity towards those we consider unenlightened. That's an evolved mindset I'm still working towards. Mom says many people are asleep, asleep, in quotes. On our spiritual journey, we, uh, journey we've tried not to judge, but we didn't always succeed. We definitely don't. I don't know whether anyone is qualified to judge anyone else without compromising karma. karma. Yet to exist, we have to gauge intent constantly, if only to protect ourselves. We're bound to judge and make mistakes when doing so, and we learn to live with it because there's no other way. Maybe when we die, we end up judging ourselves. I think there is a component of that in dying. What they call, what, what is supposedly you have a life review in, in the afterlife. And a lot of it probably is yourself reflecting on, your, on yourself. You're not by yourself, but you, you know. You know what you're like. I know what I'm like. We know, we know where our faults are most of the time, even if we don't always admit it. There's only so much we can do to make life better or are obligated to give. If we become more open while simultaneously toughening up, it will flow naturally from us into our circles of influence. A single person can contribute a lot. Our positive impact on the lives of others may be greater than we'll ever know. Even if built upon a small stream of courtesies and seeing ourselves as part of the human race, neither above nor below anyone else. 
Even someone as selfless as Mother Teresa was overwhelmed by her efforts to ease suffering. She said in all her years of service in Calcutta and her constant prayers to God, she never once felt his presence. I don't know why, unless a lifetime of, of assisting the poor and ill exposed her to constant darkness. She tried to act as a filter to absorb suffering and provide relief, but maybe it was too much. Did she feel she had to overcome it all by herself? Perhaps she eventually feared that suffering was the dominant human condition. Any of us fortunate enough to be able to feed ourselves, have shelter, and some material comforts should probably thank our stars for where and when we were born. And perhaps some responsibility also comes with that good fortune. To focus on the negative is like staring into the abyss trying to reason with blackness. But to ignore it entirely is to live in a fantasy land like my nice but deluded Rush Limbaugh loving cousins. Surely there's a balance. It's impossible to ponder darkness without being cooed by it. It's seductive because it seems to offer power. It strokes your ego, encouraging you to see yourself always as the center of existence, entitled to have your wants and needs addressed above others. Your focus, where your thoughts lie, is where you live in your mind. What you think and feel is what you are. Courage is like a muscle. It gets stronger with persistent practice. It's a lifelong endeavor. Fear is a powerful inhibitor, but if you work at building your courage, you will know what to do at the critical moments when someone really needs you or you're up against a bigger challenge. Practice courage. Any day is the right day to start. So that's the end of chapter 24. Not bad, actually. I haven't reread it um, in quite a few years. and uh, it's a, It gets a little repetitive, but, you know, it's pretty good. If I can uh, reach the back of my back to pat myself. Okay, let's see. So we can get in at least one more chapter, but can we get two? Okay, that's two short ones. So that's what we're going to do here. Uh, here we go. Tw chapter 25 is called Sex Ghost. Sex Ghost. Sex Ghost. This is embarrassing, but true. One night, I woke from a realistic sex dream in an inspired state. This has happened to you too, so cut me some slack. Men know, men know that once the blood has routed south, the only options are to wait for a slow dissipation and reunification with the rest of the body, or to take matters into your own hands, or just your right hand. As I neared the finish line, I realized a presence had been in the room with me the entire time. Yes, a, yes, a ghost hung up. Out, Yes, a ghost hung out while I buffed the banana and perhaps, help, and perhaps help set it in motion by spiking my dream content. Crazy. In the home stretch, I felt a female visitor's presence in my third eye, which heightened the sensation. At the summit, a round of super high speed head bobbing began. Like, remember the early chapters, head bobbing began. And I felt the teasing, giddy energy of the spirit. Sex, ghosts, manic playfulness, Vaguely reminded me of my original tickling visitor, but the naughty aspect was damned odd. I didn't know spirits were interested interested in sex. Why would they be? They don't have bodies, or do they? Or maybe my visitor wanted to make me feel good or have weird fun. I was too shocked to ask any questions afterward, and I've not had a visitor like it since. Now, in parentheses, it says... Later, I wondered if spirits can enter the bodies of the living in order to share what we feel. Can ghosts surf our souls for a vicarious thrill? Apparently, the answer may be yes. By late 2013, I had a CD release show at a downtown Buffalo music club. In the middle of the performance, Mom and Steve became aware of Justin's presence, our brother Justin on the other side. Like our Mexican room warp, remember Mexican room warp? Steve felt the room shift as if it wasn't entirely real. So this is at my CD release show. Mom said, Justin's here. Steve, Steve saw him emerge from one of the blue stage lights as if a small door had quickly opened and closed and felt a tap on his shoulder. Mom felt a light jab in her side. When she turned towards Steve, she saw a white shadowy trail like an arm between he and her. Justin asked Steve if he could watch my performance through his eyes. Steve said yes, and Justin jumped in, which freaked Mom out when she heard about it later. Understandably so. 
Steve said Justin also sat at one of the tables near the front of the stage in an unoccupied chair. So that's the end of the parentheses section. So I don't know if my brother Steve should have let what we believe was our brother Justin, you know, jump inside and watch the show through his eyes, but it it never lets anything bad. It was only another good, positive, spiritual experience. So uh, I think that we've all and learned the difference between like what is a good, positive, helpful presence and what is not a helpful presence and unfriendly and you, you just dispatch them. So I think everything was kosher in this instance. That's my, that's my feeling. So no worries. Um, back to the chapter. I didn't literally have sex with a ghost like in the movie MacGruber, which, by the way, is underrated and hysterically inappropriate. It really, it's, it's bad, but it's funny. But supposedly pop singer Kesha did. Uh, you can look that up if you want, or maybe not. On a gross related note, mom told me that often, told me she often felt watched by the presence of an elderly man in their bedroom when my parents first got married. The previous tenant was an old guy who who had died in the apartment. The bedroom creeped her out for years. Yuck. Okay, so that's a yucky end to the chapter, so we're going to maybe bring it back up with um, chapter 26. I'll speed through it. It's called Out of Body Tomfoolery. Now, I know there are psychics who um, do astral projection, and to them it's perfectly natural. Um, I don't, you, you'll, you'll understand when I read the chapter, but that's not something that I do or know how to do exactly or even would necessarily advocate. And this chapter really is about how it seems to me like it's something that is possible, but definitely rookies, amateurs, including myself, should not attempt it. Only like somebody who really, really is far along that path and really knows what the hell they're doing. Okay, so that's what this chapter is about. Uh, ba 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 ba. A few summers ago, I met a sassy 30 year old woman after corresponding for a short while on an internet dating site. We decided to meet for coffee downtown. She had a pretty, nearly intimidating face and was well aware of her appeal. The spot was close to her apartment, but she was plenty late. She was plenty late in the way self absorbed, attractive people think they can be because they're confident you'll wait or they don't care if you don't. I'll allow a certain I'll allow a reasonable amount of time for anyone, but past a certain point you better be Penelope Cruz. Mm, Penelope. Um, our emails had touched on a mutual interest in spiritual stuff. We jumped right in. Danielle, not a real name, expressed absolute confidence in her about in her ability to manifest wishes into reality. Though she'd recently moved back to Buffalo, she claimed that a few years earlier she'd made her floor her way to Florida on sure will. She didn't have money, but she believed that putting her wish into the universe would get it answered. Someone eventually loaned or gave her enough to move, and she found odd jobs to do on an older guy's off-coast island living lean in the sun. Hmm. I'm not entirely sure if this constitutes influencing reality so much as the persuasive power of young female biology. She may have tapped the other side because anyone can. Anyone can muck it up, too, especially if they treat spirituality like their personal wish fulfillment service. I include myself in this critique. I found her pretentious, but also intelligent, like other semi-dangerous gals I have met who possess a certain charm, but would incinerate you without blinking if they had heat vision. I didn't share much about my own spiritual experiences, and she was happy to talk about herself, so I listened and learned, interjecting occasionally. As the summer sun descended, we, lo we relocated to an outdoor patio in a cute, low-lit alley bar for drinks. It was a weeknight with almost no one around but the waitresses. Danielle told me that she had left her body multiple times, traveling and flying around rooms, something I've dreamt about for years, as many people do. In my dreams... I weave between telephone wires and big trees while floating down a street, and it's more a matter of levitation than an ability to fly, if that distinction makes a difference. I'm already potentially buoyant, and when I look at the ground and metaphorically toss off the sandbags holding down the hot air balloon that is me, I start to rise. Danielle was certain she could leave her body again, but I said I thought she was too cavalier. 
how she how could she be sure she had control? What if she left her body and couldn't get back inside? She admitted that in one instance she panicked because she, because she wasn't sure how to get back. She saw her body below her but didn't know what to do. Then somehow she got back inside. This is in parentheses. If I've painted her unflatteringly, one thing she said was spot on. When tempted to judge the seemingly poor life decisions of other people, she says to herself, she says to herself, this has nothing to do with me. By withholding judgment, she keeps her space free of negative energy. I do this more often since I met her. It's helpful. So yeah, all right. And the parentheses, spirits will almost certainly help you leave your body and achieve other odd magical feats. But since you can never be completely sure who's assisting you and why, unless, like I said, you're really evolved, like say like Diane, you know, Diane's tarot or, or Whimsy, Oracle of Whimsy, who seem to know a lot about this, um, then, uh, you know, you don't want to mess with it. But since you can never be completely sure who's assisting you and why, you can lose control of the situation as Danielle did. It also reminded me of my mom's incident with the Native American animal guide and when I got obsessive about spiritual matters before the Night of Skulls. Remember that? Um, I've never left my body, but have been close a few times. My brother Steve said it's happened to him without trying. He's observed himself from the, cor from the top corner of a room, just the way you hear people describe it, as has my ex-girlfriend Jane, my first head-bobbing eyewitness. My mom freaked when Steve told her. Though he wasn't afraid, Steve has decided to no longer allow himself to leave his body for fear of a loss of control. Steve has dialed back most of his spiritual contact in the last few years because he found it overwhelming. Yeah, he was getting all kinds of visitors day and night for a while there, and then it calmed. Since I'm human and stupid, despite cautioning Danielle about leaving her body, I was curious to see what more I could learn. A few days later, I lay down to take a nap with my cat Gabe curled against my side. I pat his stomach, closed my eyes, asked if any spirits were passing by, and made a quick contact. I screened them quickly. I should have been more thorough, though I didn't sense ill intent. I asked whether it would be possible to leave my body and float around the room, but I wasn't sure I'd go through with it. I felt the familiar, intense pressure of a presence in my third eye. As the stress increased, my head involuntarily tilted back into the pillow. That was just so crazy. So my head's tilting back as the pressure's increasing, right? It felt like my skull was being pushed down through the pillow and my, and my body was passing into the bed. But I believed what actually happened was the opposite. It was the, it was the sensation of my essence being ripped upward away from my body. I could feel my body below me simultaneously, held down while my soul rose up. I had my hand on Gabe the entire time to help keep me grounded. I'd already decided if I could no longer feel him, I would stop. As the forehead pressure increased, my neck tilted back further and my spine arched. The pressure made my mouth open and curl and the base of my skull tingled. I started to make an inadvertent moaning sound and extended, ah, that was almost painful, somewhat pleasurable, intense, and fascinating. The force was now extreme. Gabe was scared by the moaning and jumped off the bed. With reliable connection to the material world broken, I'd push the experiment far enough. I broke off contact by opening my eyes and setting up. The feeling dissipated. I'd felt in control up, in, up until that point, but to let it proceed any further would have been foolish. Especially because as I continued to harp, I couldn't fully understand the forces I was interacting with. I haven't attempted it again and won't. I've confirmed to my own satisfaction that it's possible to leave one's body, though we probably shouldn't, again, unless you know what the hell you're doing. One of my brother's friendly visitors also strongly advised against astral projection and said it has nothing to do with faith. So there you have it. That's all true. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. And I was there. <laughs> so that's the end of chapter 26. That's where we're going to leave it today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it or found it interesting at the very least. Boy, this video is long, so I'm going to check out. Um, and I'll be back soon. And I hope everybody's doing well. God willing, we are starting to make progress with the vaccines here in the United States. 
and if we get far along far enough along then maybe we can start helping other countries too because there's there's a few that are really really in bad shape brazil especially because they got that still got that moron for a president bolsonaro and um even europe is starting to tick up again so hopefully america can come to the rescue for itself and other people okay that's enough talking take care of yourselves be well happy spring bye